We have a few important announcements today, so I'll get right to it. First, I'm happy to announce that beginning this Tuesday, February 16th, we're opening up registration for the vaccine to the next age band, 70 and over. To date, over 85% of Vermonters 75 and older uh, have scheduled or already received their vaccinations, which is faster than many other states. Opening to the next age band is an important step, especially with hope on the horizon for increased supply and approval of new vaccines. I also want to reiterate another point once again. As I know, many continue to wonder why other states have broader eligibility than Vermont's. Some of our neighbors, for example, have opened to 65 and older in certain job categories as well. But again, just saying people are eligible doesn't mean they actually have the doses to cover them. That's why we've seen other states cancel appointments or have to schedule months in the future, even for those in their 70s, 80s, and even 90s. Here in Vermont, we've taken a different approach. We're setting realistic expectations based on the supply we know we're going to receive so we can do this as efficiently as possible instead of over-promising and under-delivering. To be blunt, we're just being honest with you. And as you've heard me say many times, we're targeting vaccines to those we know are most likely to die if they get sick. Because the science and data is clear. Age puts you at a higher risk for, de for death from COVID-19. And I believe we have a moral obligation to first preserve the lives of those who have taken care of us for decades. And after we begin to move through this next age band, we'll open to 65 plus, and then those with certain high risk conditions that lead to worse outcomes from the disease. Secretary Smith will provide more details and further updates on our vaccine rollout in a few minutes. Next, this Monday, I'll sign an extension to the state of emergency for another month. As a reminder, this is simply the tool we need to respond to the pandemic. But to be honest, I'm hopeful there won't be too many more of these extensions in the future. As we vaccinate more Vermonters, particularly those vulnerable to severe illness or death if they get sick, we'll begin to again turn the spigot uh, once more and get back to whatever normal will be. This goes hand in hand with some good news we've heard about vaccine supply, including increased production from Pfizer, as well as the emergency approval of Johnson & Johnson likely to happen in the coming weeks. I was happy to hear Dr. Fauci say yesterday that by April, he believes the general population could begin to have broad access to the vaccines. This is tremendously good news. Finally, last week we announced a return of certain school sports competition because we know how important it is for our kids. Today, we have some more good news. Secretary French will talk about resuming music programs, which we know are also essential to the mental health and well being of Vermont's kids. Now, just like athletics and really everything that's been reopened since the start of the pandemic, this will not look like it used to. But it's a step in the right direction and will be good for our youth. I also want to be clear we make each of these decisions in close consultation with Dr. Levine and his team of experts at the Department of Health, and also with our education and mental health experts. Because the fact is, denying kids the activities they love is causing them real harm. Some have spent almost a year with little or no contact with their friends and no sense of normalcy in their routines. We can't ignore the impact this has had on them. And as we've heard from pediatricians, they're not okay. And we shouldn't be okay with that either. So when my public health experts tell me they're comfortable giving kids a chance to do some normal activities with mitigation measures in place to limit risks, then I'm going to do it because our kids are in need. And doing what's best for them is a goal I know many of us share. So with that, I'll turn it over to Secretary French for more details. Secretary French. Uh, thank you, Governor. Uh, good morning. 
I'll begin my update by reviewing the surveillance testing results of school staff for the last two weeks. As I mentioned last week, the testing for the week of January 31st was disrupted somewhat by the snowstorm on that Tuesday. Uh, the participation rate was lower, probably as a result of scheduling challenges related to the storm. We typically see a participation rate of about 40% in the voluntary testing, but for the week of the 31st, the participation rate was 27%, about 1,600 tests. Um, testing did identify two cases of COVID-19, which translates to a positivity rate of about 0.12%. This week, the participation rate was 33% and four cases were identified. Positivity rate is 0.35%. The positivity rate from the surveillance testing of school staff has increased over the last few weeks, but still remains significantly lower than the state positivity rate, which is currently 1.8%. The two cases identified through the surveillance testing for the week of January 31st were in Rutland and Franklin counties. The four cases from this week were all in Franklin County. There is more virus activity in these counties as compared to most other areas of the state. So the surveillance testing data can be seen as confirmation of the larger patterns of the virus that we're seeing across the state. Unfortunately, the rising counts in Franklin County are likely to have an impact on school operations in the coming days. The superintendent for the districts in the Richford area alerted me last night that some of the schools will be moving to remote uh, instruction in the next couple of days. I would like to remind everyone that there's a direct connection between the cases of the virus in our communities and the cases in our schools. Please follow the state guidelines, including wearing a mask, so we can keep our schools open. We had a very productive meeting on music this week. As the governor mentioned, uh, we'll be moving forward with publishing guidance next week uh, to permit more music in our schools. As in the case with most of our school activities, it will not be music as normal, but with some restrictions. Uh, these restrictions include the following. All performers will be required to have a six by six foot distance around them when performing at all times. And for trombones, the distance requirement will be six by nine feet. When playing woodwind and brass instrumentalists will use masks that have a small slit for the mouthpiece to enter. And when they're not playing, a non-slitted mask will be worn over the slitted mask. Woodwind and brass instruments will be required to have a multi-layer bell cover uh, with a middle layer consisting of a MERV-13 filter material. The air and rehearsal spaces will need to have three complete exchanges per hour. Rehearsals will be limited to 30 minutes in length and no audience will be permitted during performances. Currently, the guidance for music is embedded in our larger Safe Schools guidance. To enact these new changes, we'll be publishing standalone guidance in music that will supersede and replace uh, the current guidance. This approach will be helpful in making changes to the music guidance as we have more experience with its implementation. Also, our new music guidance is based on the work that is happening at the national level through the National Federation of State High School Associations, or NSHS. We have learned that other states are in the process of revisiting their music guidance based on the evolving work of NSHS. So it's gonna be useful to have standalone music guidance to incorporate recommendations that might be coming down from the national level in the future. I wanna thank the leaders of the Vermont Music Educators Association for their work in pulling together the various resources for us to evaluate over the last several months. And I'd also like to thank Drs. Rask and Lee from UVM who continue to be very, very generous with their time in supporting uh, the development of our school guidance. I mentioned uh, previously that music has been one of the more challenging areas for us in terms of developing guidance. As some of our restrictions indicate, this is, there's a lot involved with music. Uh, instruments function differently from an aerosol production perspective. For example, flutes are much more safe than oboes. The mitigation measures for music are therefore relatively complex. The proposed mitigation measures have not changed much, however, from what we considered earlier in the fall. But what has changed is our confidence level and the ability of schools to implement these complex measures with fidelity. Back then, schools were still getting familiar with the basic mitigation measures to operate schools safely. Uh, we wanted to ensure schools could do that before moving on to more complex guidance areas. We looked at music again in early October when we moved schools to step three in our guidance based on their demonstrated ability to operate safely. Shortly thereafter, however, the case count started to rise again with the holiday period upon us. We are uncomfortable moving forward with music. 
situation is now different. Uh, we have made it through the holidays, and although case counts in Vermont remain elevated as compared to the pre-holiday period, schools continue to demonstrate their ability to operate safely. The big difference now is that we can start to see the light at the end of the tunnel, so to speak, with conditions likely to improve in the coming weeks with the advent of warmer weather and the vaccine making more impact. But a consideration of the cumulative negative impact of this emergency on the well-being of our students is starting to weigh more in on our decision making. We are confident our schools can manage the risks of music activities, but we also acknowledge that every day that goes by when our students are not in school brings risk as well. Music is essential to the well-being and academic success of our students. In the coming weeks, we'll look at other areas of our guidance, such as the performing arts and theater, and do a similar evaluation. As we contemplate moving into a recovery phase in education, enabling these types of activities will become a key strategy in addressing the social and emotional needs of our students and will go a long way in restoring a sense of normalcy in their lives. I think Vermont has a special responsibility to try to do more for our students since our pandemic response to date has been arguably one of the best in the world. In the early phases of the pandemic, Vermont benefited greatly from the hard lessons learned from other countries and states that were more adversely impacted by the virus. It's now our turn, our responsibility, to show others how to recover from the pandemic and to restore normalcy in the lives of our students by returning to more in-person education and in-person activities like music and the arts. That concludes my update. I'll now turn it over to Secretary Smith. Thank you, uh, Secretary French. Good morning, everyone. As Governor Scott mentioned, we have some very good news to report. Starting next week, we are opening up registration of a new age group. This will mark the beginning of phase three of our vaccination program. On Tuesday, February 16th, Vermonters 70 years old and above will be able to register to receive their COVID-19 vaccination. Registration for this group will begin at 8.15 a.m. on Tuesday. There are two ways you can register. First, you can go online at healthvermont.gov slash myvaccine, or you can call our vaccine call center at 855-722-7878. Both will be open at 8.15 on Tuesday. Our vaccine center is open actually seven days a week, 8.15 to 5.30 p.m. on weekdays and 10 to 3 on weekends. We would urge you to use the online registration system while, recognize, re, while recognizing that some may prefer calling. If you want to make an appointment online through our state operated community vaccine program, there are two steps involved. The first step is to create an account online at healthvermont.gov slash myvaccine. This can be done at any point in time, even today. You do not have to wait for your age group to become available to set up in an account. The second step is to make your appointment starting on Tuesday at 8.15 a.m. Remember, you must be in the current eligibility group of 70 and above to make an appointment. And again, if you're not able to schedule an appointment online, you can still contact our vaccine call center at 855-722-7878. As a reminder, healthcare workers in Group 1A will continue to be eligible to receive the vaccine. Hospitals will receive ongoing allocations of the vaccine for the purposes of vaccinating this group. Eligible individuals in Group 1A should contact the hospital in their area to make an appointment. I know I'm going to be repeating some information, but this is a new group, and a new age group, and I want to make sure everyone is prepared. If you are 70 and above, here's the information you will need when you make an appointment online or by phone. You will be asked your name, birthday, address, phone number, and email if you have one. You will be asked to verify your residency in Vermont. If you are not 75 years old, or older and a Vermont resident, you should not register. You will be asked 
to answer a series of health questions that are important to know for the vaccination process. You will be asked for insurance inf information, so have it handy. But you do not have to have insurance, or if you do not want to, if you do not have insurance, or you do not wish to give your insurance information, you can still register. Again, it will be helpful to have your card handy for your primary insurance. Once you've finished answering these questions, you will receive a, you will be asked to select a vaccine clinic site. We urge you to select the nearest vaccination site to your home. We have calculated where 75 year olds live and distributed the vaccine in accordance to that uh, distribution. Once you selected the site, you should select the date and time from the menu of options available. After you make your appointment online, you'll get an automatic verification letter sent to you in your email. If you have an appointment over the phone, you will collect, we will collect a phone number and email address if you have one so that you can, we can issue you a verification. A short video about the registration process and other helpful information is available at healthvermont.gov slash myvaccine. Appointments are available at clinics statewide. Here's what you can expect when you arrive at your appointment. Please arrive on time for your appointment. Once you arrive at your location, you will be asked for your name and date of birth. You will be asked to sign a vaccine administration waiver consenting to receive the shot. Then you will be vaccinated. We ask you to stay at the site for about 15 minutes so that you can be monitored for any immediate reactions to the injection. We will also get you scheduled for your second dose appointment while you are at the clinic so, you, so that you leave with that appointment in hand. Again, we cannot accommodate walk-ins. Please be sure you register in advance and arrive on your scheduled day and time. As we move forward through the additional groups, anyone who has previously been eligible will continue to be eligible. That means if you were in the 75 and over age group that we started with, you will continue to be eligible uh, with the 70 and above age group. As I mentioned on Tuesday, Walgreens will participate in the federal pharmacy program and we and will receive vaccine distribution directly from the federal government above and beyond our state allocation. They receive 2,000 doses and they have 20 locations across the state with four locations in southern Vermont. Those locations in southern Vermont are Bennington, Brattleboro, Bellis Falls, and Manchester. They are starting clinics today for Vermonters 75 and older on Tuesday. They will schedule clinics for those 70 and older. To make your appointment at Walgreens, you can access the link at healthvermont.gov slash myvaccine or go directly to the Walgreens website at walgreens.com. We will issue a press release after today's uh, briefing. As of today, nearly 70,000 eligible Vermonters have been vaccinated against COVID-19. 30,200 Vermonters received their first dose and 32,600 have received their second dose. 33,552 Vermonters age 75 and older have made an appointment for their first dose through our program, our vaccination program. So far, 38% of Vermonters in the 75 year old and above age group, as well as 538 homebound Vermonters have received their first dose of COVID-19 vaccine. This week, we are adding agencies helping us to administer vaccines to the homebound individuals. And these will include Addison County Home Health, Central Vermont Home Health, UVM Home Health and Hospice, Waterbury EMS, which will be helping in vaccinating in Lamoille County, um, Garnett EMS, which will be doing Chittenden and Grand Isle counties, and Newport EMS. The next phase includes vaccinating homebound members, community members who do not utilize home health services. We anticipate this phase to begin next week and we'll have further details at that time. 
Health clinics coming on board next week include Copley Hospital in Lamoille County, Gifford Medical Center in Orange County, and North Country Hospital in Orleans County. All will start vaccinating sev Vermonters 70 years old and older. Phase three uh, with an age grouping of 70 years old and older is the smallest of the age group we have identified for priority vaccinations with approximately 33,200 Vermonters. We should be able to register and schedule and ultimately vaccinate this age group relatively quickly before moving on to those 65 years, Vermonters 65 years and older um, in which will be called phase four. After that, we'll move into phase five that encompasses those ages 16 to 64 with high risk conditions. Dr. Levine has mentioned previously uh, some of those uh, high risk conditions. Vaccinating Vermonters who are at the highest risk first allow us, us, as the governor mentioned, to minimize death and hospitalization. And as the governor has previously mentioned, we are now discussing and planning for phase six. Of course, all of our future planning is contingent on the supply of uh, vaccine from the federal government. Uh, but so far, we have seen a consistent uh, supply come in through the last few weeks. I will now turn uh, to Dr. Levine, who will give an health update. Thank you. <clears throat> Just have a few slides to go through to sort of set the table for the rest of the presentation. Total cases now at 13,415, deaths at 189. I would like to comment, though, that the, again, pace of the additional deaths has slowed considerably from where it had been. I show this slide mainly to show there's been uh, quite a bit of fluctuation with regard to uh, daily case counts in Vermont. We were uh, in double digits for several days. We're now at 162 for the most recent day. The importance of this slide is that no matter what our case count on an individual day, you can see by the very light blue bars that our testing itself is quite exuberant. And we have abundant testing uh, almost every day of the week letting us arrive at a positivity rate in the 1.6 to 1.7 percent range pretty consistently at this time. This time of year, we would normally see a tremendous amount of influenza. We would see on this slide of percent of emergent care visits for symptoms related to diseases like COVID and influenza, a tremendous amount of activity. As you can see in the right part of the graph, there's very little of that at this time. Quite remarkable. And I'm showing this slide now as I'll be discussing it a little later. This is the uh, outbreaks in long-term care facilities. The, the reason for the slide is not the names of the facilities, it is the small number of the facilities it's not the numbers of cases, but it's the fact that cumulatively there are very few cases. So just keep that in the back of your mind as we uh, discuss it later on. The only thing I haven't shown you is that hospitalizations have slightly decreased to 47, as has ICU bed occupancy, which is down to 11. <clears throat> now, as you know, uh, some of the reason for our case counts has to do with the fact that we have been seeing rising cases in three counties, Bennington, Rutland, and Franklin. And I can share a few points. <clears throat> in the past two weeks, Bennington County reported 244 cases with 51 associated with active outbreaks. Realized just from that ratio that active outbreaks are not the main driving force for the activity in Bennington County, nor in the other counties I'll discuss. 
This is a sign that there is significant community transmission of virus occurring. We were seeing increases in multiple towns in the county for the past several weeks, but this week only one town was flagged by our teams, so to me this indicates some improvement, but it's a little early to be certain yet. For Rutland County in the past two weeks, there were 306 cases reported, of which 83 were associated with active outbreaks. The area still continues to see high rates of COVID-19, but only a few towns have been noted by our teams as seeing an increase. And finally, with regard to Franklin County, in the past two weeks, they have reported 244 cases. There are 68 cases associated with active outbreaks. Several towns have seen increases, many of them due to household transmission and community transmission. We are very hopeful uh, that we have provided a fair amount of communication, messaging, discussions with local officials, uh, and access to testing, as you'll hear, in, Rut in Franklin County. That one, unlike Bennington and Rutland, who are now on the downslope, uh, is actively increasing, but at a much lower uh, absolute number. The goal is to really nip that in the bud through active compliance of the part of the population with public health guidance and increase in testing so that containment can be carried out. So my message to Vermonters in these areas is, we need you to do your part to change this trajectory. If you're not consistently wearing a mask or keeping your distance, if you're gathering with people you don't live with, if you're traveling, you may not only be contributing to the spread of the virus, but also holding us all back from the future we're working towards. That time when we have fewer COVID cases and deaths, less illness and hospitalizations, when we can start taking steps toward our previous ways of life. In addition to consistently and conscientiously taking these everyday actions to prevent COVID-19, masks, physical distancing and avoiding crowds, I again ask Vermonters in these areas to get tested. The sooner you know you are positive, the sooner you can take steps to protect yourself and others. And there are more testing opportunities available. For instance, in Rutland County in the coming days at Rutland Regional Medical Center. In Bennington County, I mentioned on Tuesday, new testing options in Manchester and there's also testing opening in Stratton. I would like to thank Bromley Resort, Stratton Mountain, and the town of Manchester for partnering with health and expanding testing opportunities in Bennington County. And there are plenty of open appointments in Franklin County, in Swanton, Enosburg, Fairfax, in addition to testing available in St. Albans at Kinney Drugs. Moving to another topic, we have heard a lot about variants of the virus across the country that may cause the virus to spread more quickly. And as we announced yesterday, <clears throat> we now have some evidence that there's likely a variant of concern here in Vermont. Through wastewater testing, the city of Burlington detected the presence of two COVID-19 virus mutations that are associated with the B117 mutant or variant, which was first discovered in the United Kingdom. This is a strong indicator that the virus is probably present in the community. We still need to confirm the presence of the variant through genetic sequencing of individual samples from people who may have had positive tests or COVID-19. Mutations and variants are expected over time the reason the B117 variant is concerning is because it is thought to be more transmissible and could lead to more cases of COVID-19 as well as potentially increased hospitalizations and deaths. It's been found in 34 states now and I've said many times we do expect it to find it in Vermont as well. However, learning this news doesn't really mean we have to change anything we do we just need to do it all the better. Always wear that mask when you are outside your household. Keep at least a six foot distance. 
and avoid any place that looks even remotely crowded. And the CDC has just come out with some new research about so-called double masking, which I've spoken about here. It found that wearing a cloth mask over a surgical mask offers more protection against the coronavirus, as does tying knots on the ear loops of the surgical masks, so-called knotted and tucked masks. I realized that these were experiments in a physical chemistry lab and that they were not done with sick people coughing or breathing on well people and recording how well illness was prevented. But the simple and compelling conclusion was that a good fit of the mask increases how well the mask might protect. I want to emphasize this is not something that we all need to do. The most important thing is we just need to wear a mask, period. But if you are concerned about the fit of your mask, or want that additional degree of protection from a tighter fit, it may be worth trying, especially if the new enemy is a more transmissible virus variant. <clears throat> On another CDC-related update, they've just released new guidance for people who have been fully vaccinated but are exposed to someone with COVID-19. The CDC now says that these people do not need to quarantine so long as they are fully vaccinated, meaning at least two weeks has passed since their second dose of the current vaccines, they're within three months following the receipt of their last dose of the vaccine, and they have no symptoms since the current exposure. So this means that if you fit these criteria, meaning first and foremost that you've actually been vaccinated, and you come into contact with a COVID positive person, you no longer need to quarantine. There's an exception, however, for vaccinated inpatients and residents in healthcare settings like long-term care for settings. They still need to quarantine. I can share today that Vermont will follow this new guidance about quarantine. This is really great news and shows we believe vaccination not only protects you from getting infected in those 90 days, but also that you won't be able to spread the virus either. As you know, quarantine is also currently required for travel. We are not met yet making any changes to travel-related quarantine for fully vaccinated people, but we are being very thoughtful about it and exploring its impact. We hope to have more to say about it next week. Keep in mind, the CDC just came out with its uh, new guidance uh, about 36 hours ago. Now you've already heard from Secretary Smith that we're expanding our vaccine eligibility to people 70 and older starting on Tuesday. We're glad to be able to offer the vaccine to more Vermonters and I know how eager many of you will be to make your appointment. I just want to reiterate to everyone, we appreciate your patience with the process. We expect high call volumes on Tuesday but there will be enough appointments for everyone. Please do not call to make your appointment before Tuesday because you won't be able to. If you plan to make your appointment online, however, I want to repeat that you can prepare ahead of time by creating an account in our online system. This will help you get a step ahead so you can easily log in on Tuesday to schedule your appointment. You can also find answers to your questions, watch a video, and learn tips for making your appointment. Visit healthvermont.gov slash myvaccine for, my, for more information. I also want Vermonters age 75 and older to know that there are still plenty of appointments available around the state. So if you haven't made an appointment yet, please call us, go online, or ask a friend or family member to help you. We especially encourage those who are eligible in Rutland, Franklin, and Bennington counties where we're seeing increased spread so they may protect themselves by getting vaccinated. On another vaccine-related note, we continue to see success in vaccinating residents in our long-term care facilities. Remember the slide I showed earlier. We're seeing markedly fewer cases and outbreaks and deaths at these facilities coincident with our very aggressive testing and admission protocols 
and the strong work of our outbreak prevention response teams, but also while the pace of vaccination in these facilities has really accelerated. I might add this is a phenomenon that's being noted around the country now and shows the true success of this vaccination strategy. Over 90% of residents in Vermont's skilled nursing facilities, assisted living facilities, and residential care homes have received at least their first dose of the COVID-19 vaccine. Clinics are ongoing, but so far, almost two-thirds of residents have received their second dose. This will help us to prepare for how we help these facilities loosen some of the restrictions and allow, <clears throat> and allow residents to interact safely with each other and their loved ones. We know how important this is to their health and well-being, and we'll have more to say on this in a future press conference. Finally, I understand many schools have vacation coming up, some as soon as next week. So I just want to acknowledge to all of the parents out there, it may not be a vacation for you. We're all tired. These days off school may put actually extra strain on your family, especially when parents are working from home. Unfortunately, we still are somewhat limited in some of our activities right now. So please try and avoid those indoor get togethers and sleepovers. But with masks, six foot spaces, we can get outside and enjoy some of the snow with others very safely. Try to keep your connections with friends and family strong and reach out for support when you need it. I'll turn it back to the governor now. Thank you, Dr. Levine. We'll now open it up to questions. We'll start with Calvin. Um, Thank you, Governor. So uh, probably a question for Dr. Levine. So Dr. Levine, getting back to the guidance that came out from the CDC um, about having your being fully vaccinated for more than two weeks but less than three months, um, what does this tell us about the efficacy of the vaccine after three months and it's, you know, whether it's uh, effective in the long term? Thanks for asking that question, because I want to be very clear about this. The CDC is being uh, appropriately cautious, but I don't want that to be viewed in a pessimistic way, because the reality is they're waiting for more data because all of the people in the vaccine trials continue to be followed over time, and they recognize and have even told the population that by March we expect one of the mutants, the variant strains, the UK one, to perhaps become the dominant strain in the country. So they didn't want to jump the gun too quickly uh, and go beyond the 90 days, not knowing exactly how that might play out with the variant strain. However, I believe, and I have good knowledge to be able to say this, that they were planning on 180 days originally. And just because of cautions about this uh, topic I just brought up, they held it to 90. It's obviously something that they can easily extend uh, once they have more data and see the impact. But uh, it has nothing to do with uh, belief that the vaccine is not going to be durable during that time period. And then um, probably a question for Secretary Smith as well. Um, you know, it, it appears that we're getting a more, or beginning to have a more steady and predictable stream of the vaccine coming through. So. Um, I'm, I'm wondering, you know, if you're anticipating um, the time frame that we get through the 70 plus, the 65 plus age bands, if you're anticipating that to speed up, and if so, um, if we're going to have to rebook appointments for, for some Vermonters. Well, of course, it could always speed up depending on the vaccine, but we have planned that we would be done with the 65 plus when we, we said, you know, between somewhere in the second week of March and the last week of March, I think we're still on that time schedule. I think in the beginning of March, you'll start seeing a switch to the next age band, which is the 65 plus, um, given the size of this age band and given what we've seen in terms of the predictability of the vaccine coming in and our ability to sort of get it out the door. 
So I, I think we're on the original time frame uh, that I had mentioned before, if not a little faster uh, than I had mentioned before. But uh, I would expect, you know, in several weeks we'll, we'll be announcing another band that will be opening. Just a quick follow-up to that. You mentioned phase six, which is going to be the um, phase after 18 to 65 with underlying conditions. I guess can you just kind of elaborate on what that age band or what that priority schedule would like. I, I think the governor had mentioned at previous press conferences, and I'll just reiterate, we're looking at that now. We, we, we you know, we're looking at the various options that, that what that would look like in phase six. Uh, we, we don't have any sort of uh, predetermined uh, view of that right now, but we are talking about it e extensively. Um, in response to your first question, Calvin, I, I think this really does um, highlight the beauty of the way we're doing this. Uh, other states uh, are, as you mentioned, with the increased supply uh, coming into their states, and they've, they've already made their uh, reservations appointments months in advance. Uh, they are going to have to be forced with either moving them up, rescheduling, uh, bringing other people to the front of the line, so to speak, uh, after others have made their, their uh, appointments. And with us doing it the way we're doing it with these uh, age bands, uh, it's, and, and we're contemplating a three-week supply that they've continued uh, to uh, advocate for on the federal level, giving us that uh, continuity, uh, this gives us the, the option of speeding that up, right? So, so if we get through the, the next banding, uh, this 70 and over banding, which is smaller, in a matter of three weeks, um, then we'll know what our next supply is going to be and we'll be able to increase the number of, uh, of appointments. So again, it just signifies, I think we're doing this right. And I, and I think it'll be more seamless uh, than other states who have opened up to this broad, broad category. Uh, and, uh, and, and this is more realistic and will get us there faster. So I think that that's, uh, that's why we did what we've done uh, in, in regards to that and as well as to uh, just a fairness uh, standpoint and making sure we take care of those who are most at risk of uh, health uh, um, implications as well as death uh, as a result. So, and in the other, uh, the six, I think uh, Secretary Smith said it right, we are just contemplating all kinds of options. We may uh, continue to do uh, just the age banding, uh, but we may do something else. We're just considering that as we speak. Uh, Governor, the uh, the Senate, it was uh, introduced into the Senate anyway, the bill, uh, extending sports betting to the state of Vermont. Uh, this is kind of off topic a little bit, but uh, how do you feel about that? Uh, with the money, I believe the money's going to the general fund, not necessarily to, um, you know, to education or something, but. Well, as you might recall in the last, uh, I don't remember which year it was, over the last four years, we've actually uh, promoted that and advocated for that. So. Uh, suffice, to, suffice it to say that I, my opinion hasn't changed. I think we should allow that, and uh, where it goes uh, will be determined. But we have a, a lot of need, and, and uh, in some respects, getting this uh, on the table is uh, is good news. Um, and since you are in favor of that, who are you betting on for the uh, Daytona 500 this Well, week? I'm not betting on it. <laughs> we don't have the sports betting at this point in time, but um, I have my uh, I have my favorites. Uh, and that would be? <laughs> <laughs> a number of different uh, drivers. Uh, that, uh, and we have a lot of connections, you know, right. uh, in terms of Vermonters being a part of the NASCAR teams. In fact, my, uh, my godson is the uh, crew chief on one of the, the 42 car. So that will be uh, on the top of the list for me. Long shot. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Yes, good morning. Um, continuing with the non-vaccine-related thread here. Um, Governor, you made a little cameo yesterday on the floor of the U.S. Senate. Uh, what do you think of that? And, and would you advise the Senate to convict? You know, I've been uh, very clear uh, over the last four or five years. Um, my feelings haven't changed uh, on, uh, 
on our former president, a character and integrity matter to me and uh, continue to. Uh, but um, I feel, again, we all have a responsibility as leaders uh, to, to lead uh, with, with integrity. And, and I think our words do matter. And what the president has done, he put his ego in himself before the country. And, uh, and I think that that is dangerous to our way of life, our constitution, our country. And I think that, uh, that again, words matter, the truth matters, honesty matters. And, and I think the, the Senate should, uh, should contemplate all of the above. Everything that I've seen, I think, is, is clear. I think the, the House managers did a, did a good job in presenting the case. And I think it's uh, quite clear uh, that they, they have to do the right thing. They have to impeach the president, the former president. Because if we don't, we're condoning this action and it will replicate in the future. And that's the most dangerous part. It's not about as much about President Trump, former President Trump, as it is about the precedent it sets. And if this is okay to do, I guarantee it will be done again in the future. And it will undermine our country, our, our way of life, and our constitution. Secondly, uh, what was your reaction to the remark uh, Commissioner Sherling made uh, and apologized for? Well, I, again, I think uh, Commissioner Sherling uh, did the right thing in apologizing. Obviously, uh, this was offensive uh, to, to many. And we all learn from this. And I think this is a, a moment uh, to, to learn uh, about that words do matter. Again, uh, learning, uh, you know, finding out the meaning of it, the root uh, of, the, uh, of the, the, the word itself uh, was something all of us uh, should, should reflect on. But I think he did the right thing. Uh, and he, he didn't, uh, his intention uh, wasn't to, to hurt anyone. Um, and he apologized for it. So. I think he did, uh, he did the right thing. Thank you. Greg, the Bennington Banner. Thank you. Hello, thank you. Uh, my question is, um, the Taconic and Green Regional School District here in Manchester uh, sent a letter to, um, to uh, Secretary French and the Commissioner Levine with regards to um, prioritizing uh, teachers to receive the vaccine when uh, supply becomes available in Vermont, saying that it would help uh, to um, make it possible for students to return in person in April. I um, wondered if you had received that letter, uh, either, either of uh, you gentlemen, and uh, what your reaction is to, to that request. Secretary French. Yes, thank you. Um, <clears throat> yes, I will. I will observe. That's my former school district, so I always enjoy hearing from them, and I appreciate their advocacy. Um, I did. I did respond and merely said that. Thank you very much for your advocacy. Um, but as, as we've been fairly clear, um, our strategy um, for vaccination is really uh, de determined right now on the limited supply, and that'll no doubt. Our strategy will no doubt evolve as the supply increases. Okay, thank you. Aaron, VT Digger. Aaron. All right, we'll go to Joe, Barton Chronicle. Hello. Um, I guess this is a question for Secretary French. Um, listening to your outline of the proposed changes um, for music, um, I noticed that singing wasn't included, although you referred to um, further changes to come in performing arts. As am I to assume that that's where whatever you decide to do to uh, allow or continue to ban singing together uh, will come? 
Oh, thanks for the question. No, singing will be included in the music guidance that we'll be issuing next week. Uh, we'll we'll look at uh, performing arts such as theater uh, in the future, but singing is included in our new music guidance. Thank you. Uh, and one other question. This is a general question. Um, it's been, you know, getting on towards a month since the change in administration, and I'm curious: has that um, meant? Um, a change one way or another in the state's relationship with uh, the federal government uh, as far as COVID policy and the availability of vaccine? Well, again, uh, Joe, as I mentioned, I think on Tuesday, we have seen an increase in supply. Um, I don't know whether we would have seen that uh, increase in supply uh, regardless of the, uh, the administration. Um, but we're in a pretty good spot. I do enjoy having the um, the conversations on a weekly basis, which we had regularly with the former administration as well. Uh, Vice President Pence uh, was uh, very good about his time and, and provided for the National Governors Association to have those meetings. So this is not a, a real change other than this is uh, every single week. And they give us uh, some some uh, sense of what they're going to do over the next three weeks. So they're guaranteeing us a supply over the next three weeks, which we didn't have before. Uh, now, again, if the, uh, if the former administration had stayed in place, maybe we would have had that uh, regardless, but, uh, but we do enjoy that today. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you. I'm wondering um, how soon would um, people in that age group, 70 and older, be able to get an appointment? Will that be? Will those be starting next week? Do you think? Yeah, it's my um, understanding that yes, that would uh, that could start. Um, there would be slots open sometime next week. So yes. Okay, and then I had a question for Dr. Levine about the um, detection of the mutation that might show the variant. Um, how long does that testing that the health department's doing, how long does that usually take? So the genome sequencing uh, yes. takes takes about a week. Okay. So and we won't have information. Yeah, we won't have information on that till next week. We send that out right now. Okay. Somebody yeah, and and right now that's being done in the state of Massachusetts. Um, in concert with their public health lab, but we're rapidly working on trying to gain additional capacity here at UVM and with our state public health lab. Okay. And has the, has the health department started some of that testing previously on other specimens? Yes. So um, I announced on um, Tuesday that we received the uh, first results um, from specimens across the state um, that were all negative for the variant. Oh, okay. <clears throat> and okay, we, thank you. Thank and, you very and, much. Yeah, and we do have a sort of set of criteria that we use for uh, determining how to sample specimens across the state um, and really try to prioritize them so we could get the highest yield. Needless to say, we've added an additional, additional criterion based on what just happened this week, and that is if variant strains are discovered in wastewater uh, analyses. Thank you. I see. Thank you. Cameron, this is Albans Messenger. Magazine. I have a couple of questions for Mike Smith, but first of all, Governor, it would be nice to see Ryan Newman get that that victory this year after that terrible accident he had at the end of the, the race last year. But for Mike Smith, there, you know, I was, I was wondering, I saw the, the notice, the, the tweet this morning about trying to get people who are 75 plus to get vaccinated. As, is the reason, is part of the reason why we're moving so fast to the next phase because the percentage 
percent of 75 plus is not as high as you're expecting and maybe perhaps not as high as you would like it to be i think we're we're actually have a very high turnout in the 75 plus but secretary smith Yeah, Tim, I think uh, we'll, we'll get the analysis on what we're seeing on this. Um, you know, we had about, that age group is about 49,000. Of course, you've got to subtract those that um, have already gotten a vaccine because many of them are in long-term care facilities as well. Um, and, and actually, there are a few that are in um, Group 1A as well. So you subtract that out, you subtract out you know, what you think will not be um, taking part based upon what we've seen in long-term care facilities that have declined taking. And I think we're pretty much right on where we had anticipated. Um, there still will be, what we saw in 1A is that we saw people sort of hold back a little bit and then come forward. Uh, but, you know, we're, we've got 33,000 people signed up. I think in, by the end of it, we'll probably, you know, be in the high 30s, and that's where we anticipated this would be. Uh, the, other, the other thing, and this would need to be more meaningful coming from you, but I know someone who was 75-plus um, who went over to Essex to get vaccinated, and they asked for a photo ID, and... Luckily, they had actually a, a driver's license with them. Um, maybe you can clarify whether people need a photo ID or not when they go to get vaccinated. They don't. Um, we're not requiring um, an ID in the health care clinics, and I was, uh, I'll make sure that the message gets out to our health care partners as well. Um, we, what we are requiring is that they attest to their age and their residency when they sign up. But what we have found in, in many cases uh, in this population, a lot of people don't have driver's license in this, in this population. So uh, asking them for a driver's license may be burdensome. Also, you, you, you want as less stress and as less administrative uh, role for this population when they come to be vaccinated. So let me look into that a little bit, uh, Tim. All right, thank you, Secretary Smith. Devin, Local 22. Scott, um, can you hear me? We can. Um, so U.S. Attorney Christina Nolan uh, asked to resign from her position as part of the transition. Just wondering um, if you had any sort of broad thoughts on her time in the position some of the qualities that you would be looking for um, in the next U.S. attorney, and if you have any sort of early recommendations on your mind? Yeah, um, it's unfortunate. Uh, this is part of politics, and there's a new administration coming in, and it's not as though uh, this is uh, unfounded. It's, it happens. It's happened in previous administrations. But I have uh, a great uh, deal of respect and admiration uh, for Christina uh, and Christina Nolan, she's done a terrific job as U.S. Attorney. Um, it would be it would be my hope uh, that uh, she would have been reappointed, because she's exactly what we need. Uh, she's she's not biased. Uh, she's objective, and uh, she does her job very well. So, I uh, the qualities I would look for, uh, just the same qualities that Christina Nolan had and does have. But I'm not uh, in. I'm not going to be the one uh, it being part of that decision making. All right, thank you, Lisa, the Valley Reporter. Hi, thanks for taking my call. I have a couple of hospitality um, questions, probably for Secretary Curley. Local inns and wedding venues are concerned that they may lose an entire second season of weddings and events. They've asked for better state guidelines and metrics to help them know if contracted events that they scheduled last June can take place this June, in addition to events that are scheduled for spring, summer, and fall. Is there a plan coming? Uh, thank you for the question, Lisa. Um, absolutely, our team is working on how to help the industry understand what the, what the realm of possibilities might be for the summer. 
Um, a lot of exciting news uh, coming out right now. You know, our vaccines are, are obviously going a little bit faster than we originally um, could have even hoped for. And the CDC coming out this week talking about the, um, the, the vaccine and that you don't have to quarantine if you've been exposed, if you've had your, your vaccine. Um, so there's a lot of good movement here and hopefully these things will help us uh, figure out more quickly what we can imagine for the summer, but we're incredibly um, sensitive and, and understanding of the challenges that they're in and, and the need for planning. And so, um, yes, our team is working 24 seven behind the scenes, trying to figure out how to, how to answer those questions. Just a, a quick follow-up, to receive the go-ahead in May is not sufficient time for them to be able to plan. Do you have a, a more concrete time frame for when they might receive metrics and guidance? Uh, that, I mean, again, you know, hopefully in the next couple of weeks we can at least give them an update that will give a better feel for that. Um, again, so much is happening right now. and. I wouldn't want to get out in front of the team, but we are absolutely working on that. And we recognize that there are events planned even in as early as May that are, uh, that are hanging in the balance right now with, with a decision on what they might, again, imagine possible. Great. And then my second half question is from a restaurant owner who wants to know if the state will be changing its restaurant guidelines so that people who are in a pod together can dine together. She points out that this would really help restaurants. Yeah, I hear from restaurant owners that are trying to navigate that. We really do appreciate the folks that are, the restaurant owners um, that are holding that back right now. Um, again, we hope to have a lot of changing very quickly and we hope to have some good news in the coming coming weeks, um, but again, at the moment, would really ask that restaurant owners uh, adhere to that request that, that diners are within their own household at this point. Great. Thanks very much for your time. You bet. Chris, the Newport Daily Express. Yes, good afternoon. Uh, we're hearing from veterans groups who are wondering when they might be able to reopen and if there's any funding available to make up for the loss of revenue when they've been um, open off and on during the, about the, during the past 12 months or so, uh, the bills keep coming in and they still continue to help people, but they have low income. Um, well, first of all, Chris, and I'll ask uh, Secretary Curley to, to add to this, but uh, they're in with the mix of all the different uh, enterprises, all the different sectors who are wondering when are they going to get back to normal. Uh, and this is something we talk about every single day. As you've seen over the last uh, couple of weeks, even after over the last week, there's been a tremendous change. Uh, some good news from the CDC. I expect we'll have more. We're seeing more um, vaccine supply than we anticipated. Uh, there, is, there is going to be, we believe, another manufacturer, Johnson & Johnson, that may get approved by the end of the month. This could uh, really make a huge difference uh, to the way we do things and, and, uh, and, and how we approach uh, the reopening. Every week we're trying to, to find something more uh, that we're comfortable with. We base it on the science and the data. And uh, this week, uh, it was, uh, or last week, it was, it was sports. Uh, this week, uh, it's music and, and, uh, and, and other uh, enterprises, uh, you know, other things that we can do. I believe, uh, to open up safely. So we are as anxious as everyone else, and, uh, but we'll do it uh, in a manner that's safe for everyone uh, too. But, uh, but we're seeing, again, uh, some uh, dramatic increases in, in a lot of areas that are, that are good. It's good news, actually. Uh, good news for us here in Vermont. Secretary Curley. Sure. Um, yes, Governor, uh, we'll be updating some guidance this afternoon uh, to to clarify that clubs may um, may utilize their space for things that are permissible under current guidance. So, for example, we have some clubs that are looking to offer blood drives. Um, we have some that are vaccination sites. Um, some have the ability and are licensed to actually operate as a restaurant. Um, some like to offer, uh, to operate consistently with our indoor uh, entertainment. So, for example, you could host bingo there. But again, anything that is offered in those clubs 
you must be able to follow some of our guidance, any, a portion of our guidance that's on our website currently and um, entirely. And it has to be done with a straight face. What we don't want is for social events to be happening at these clubs right now um, because we're not ready to, again, permit that, that to, to be happening. We had uh, too much um, transmission and, and community transmission, and it's just something we're still holding tight on. But to the extent people can, clubs can, can offer something that is, is allowed in our guidance currently and follow it to the T, we are um, encouraging them to, to do that. Okay, thank you. Mike Donahue, the Islander. Mike? Thank, thanks, Rebecca. Uh, Governor, <clears throat> yesterday Veronica Lewis pleaded guilty in state court to attempted murder for shooting Daryl Montague, Westford man, three times. And he, she, she pled guilty earlier this week in federal court to felony, two felony charges stemming from that same shooting. That case sparked a lot of con controversy because uh, you had asked T.J. Donovan to and Sarah George initially dropped that case and three others. I mean, she couldn't win the case because insanity defense was being used. You asked T.J. Donovan to take another look. He, he filed charges. The federal government filed charges. So now both state and federal prosecutors have obtained criminal convictions on cases that Sarah George said she couldn't win. Somebody asked you last week, and you said you hadn't been briefed on, on the details, but now both cases have happened. As governor and the person <clears throat> ultimately responsible for public safety in Vermont, with your reaction to those convictions, specifically if you can reflect back to State Attorney George's criticism that you had asked for a second opinion. Yeah, I guess um, from my perspective, uh, this is uh, good news. It's something that I'd advocated for, as you mentioned. I'd asked the uh, Attorney General, T.J. Donovan, to take another look, and uh, he did, thankfully. And I believe there's been two out of the three cases that he has had uh, an impact on. So I'm, I'm appreciative of that. Uh, I also want to uh, acknowledge that uh, um, uh, U.S. Attorney uh, Nolan uh, as well uh, moved forward uh, on with a federal prosecution and was successful there. And I know you mentioned that, but uh, she deserves a lot of credit. So uh, I'm not sure. Uh, we have not heard at this point from the victim uh, to uh, obtain whether he feels this has been justified uh, from his standpoint. I know that must be difficult, but uh, but again, this is, uh, I believe, if you add it up, and, and it still isn't finalized, but uh, if you add up the six years minimum on uh, federal charges, as well as the 10 years minimum on the uh, state charges, that's 16 years. <clears throat> so uh, I think it's good news. I do think those are concurrent. Uh, they're running together, so it may be only 10 years. We'll be on supervision for 40. But yeah, whatever. maybe I missed um, that. I thought it was uh, in addition to, but you may be right. Okay. Another question is, we got several questions from across Vermont in recent weeks related to the VA hospital in White River Junction. Apparently, they're getting a large number of vaccines and have been providing shots for people 65 and up, not just 75 and up, but any veteran 65 and up. And one veteran called this week to say, like he called the VA on Tuesday and was told, you know, he could come in Wednesday for his shot. He arrived and he talked about how streamlined the process was. They do them in groups of six. Um, apparently they're having a walk-in clinic, he tells me, tomorrow that any veteran 65 and up can go in and get their shots. I mean, what can the state learn from the VA? I mean, it's the state even communicating. I haven't heard much from during these sessions about the, the VA, what they're offering. And, you know, are there clinics and vaccines impacting the Vermont numbers uh, that you might not be aware that Vermonters are getting vaccines there and your numbers may be off? I, I wasn't aware uh, that it was a 65 and over category at the VA. I knew that they were administering uh, some of the vac uh, vaccinations, but uh, I'll let uh, Secretary Smith answer. 
Mike, you said over 65 and a veteran. That's interesting to me. That's what I'm, that, <laughs> that's what I'm told uh, the person who was ineligible in Vermont that yeah. he was not I've, in the 75, but he I've, clearly is over 65. M Mike, I'm, I'm kind of joking because I'm in that category. Um, oh, I didn't think I didn't think you'd have hit fifty yet, sir. <laughs> I um I, I I know that they were vaccinating veterans. Um, I know you have to be a veteran to be vaccinated. In that, I didn't know the age bands. I know that they started with World War II veterans. Um, and we have been in communication uh, with the VA. I think at some point, you know, we we want to partner with the VA. Uh, but, you know, we, they're, what you're telling me in terms of how efficient they are is what I'm hearing back about our, our operations, both at the hospital partner level and at the uh, health uh, department's pods as well. So let me look into that. Um, that's a good suggestion. But we have been in contact with them in terms of what we can do to partner uh, with one another. And... Um, uh, I think I'll hold off in terms of my vaccination until uh, the state of Vermont tells me when it's ready to go. Well, sounds like you're having a clinic. It sounds like you might make uh, 65 and up now, you're telling me. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks, Mike. Thank you, everybody. Yeah, Mike, if I could just add to that, uh, the bottom line is we want all Vermonters to get their vaccinations. Um, and if the VA is able to do uh, veterans uh, and they're doing it like it sounds as though they might be doing it in an age banding fashion, uh, maybe they're just getting through the categories. Uh, and so they'll be moving to another age band as well. I know they have reached out. Uh, I've spoken um, to uh, the CEO at, um, at the Veterans Administration and he has offered uh, to help and we have put that into the, the, the mix. So we'll be leaning on them in the future. And if they can get through all their veterans, uh, that only helps us here in Vermont as well. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Governor. Appreciate it. Have a good weekend. Greg, the County Courier. Thank you, Rebecca and Governor. Good afternoon, uh, Secretary Smith and staff. Uh, just a quick follow-up on that. Secretary Smith, you said that you were going to wait until the state uh, was in your age bracket, uh, but uh, the governor just said he wants to see everybody get vaccinated when they're eligible. You're eligible, so why not get vaccinated now? Yeah, he, he's going to follow the state guidelines and wait till we uh, open up that 65 and over category. Okay. Um, at the sake of uh, upsetting those who kind of lobbied for the reopening of sports. Governor, uh, we're seeing a big spike here in Franklin County, uh, as well as uh, Bennington and Brattleboro County. Just in Franklin County, in the next 36 hours, we're going to see 10 teams play, either teams coming from other counties or Franklin County teams traveling to other counties. Uh, earlier, Dr. Levine talked about uh, meeting with people you don't live with and traveling outside of your area as major factors in spreading the virus. Should parents and community members in Addison and Washington, Lamoille counties be worried about players traveling in and out of their counties uh, for sports? Yeah, I think, uh, again, I'll let Dr. Levine answer this, but uh, from my perspective, I believe we presented this uh, in not saying uh, that there wouldn't be any risk, but there is some risk. Uh, to doing this. Everything we do uh, with a pandemic is, comes with some risk assessment. And we decided uh, the mental health of our youth was important. Uh, giving them something to do that they haven't been able to do for quite some time was important. And we, uh, we weighed out the, the, all the, the risks associated with such and made the decision to move forward. Um, and I, I don't regret that decision, but I think that uh, they have to, you know, parents have a responsibility to take care of their kids and, and everyone has to weigh this out on their own. Uh, Commissioner Levine. And, you know, one thing we are very confident of is the amount of guidance that we provided and the amount of stipulations that are included. So keep in mind that, you know, parents will not be attending these games as spectators. 
probably won't even be chauffeuring their children because they'll probably arrive on a school bus uh, as a team and then they will play the game and leave. Um, that's the way the guidance is framed. And of course, no matter what the sport, they're going to be wearing a mask and they're going to be distanced. If it's basketball, they're going to be distanced when they're on the bench. They're going to be distanced when they're not playing uh, on the court. Um, and they're going to have their mask on at all times. So um, I, I understand where your level of concern is coming from, from some of the parents. But the reality is um, this may indeed be one of the safest things that their families can be participating in uh, at a time when certain counties have more activity of COVID than others. I, I understand at least two schools have kind of pulled the plug on sport. For the weekend, maybe so in Randolph. How many other how many other schools have you heard of that are that are saying, you know what, now's not the time? Uh, I've not heard of any. I could ask Secretary French or Secretary Moore if they've uh, been informed at all. I had Dr. Levine. I don't I don't have a sense of that yet either. No, uh, okay. this is Secretary Moore, and I, I would uh, concur with that and only add that, that we've been very clear when asked that it is a, a school or district-specific decision as to when they, they feel confident in moving forward. Okay, um, I'd love to have a follow-up on you get any additional information. Uh, I'd also like uh, Greg, Dr. Levine, the, uh, the, the data uh, that was on Friday, if you could get that out. Uh, moving on to my second question real quick. Uh, I'm hearing about healthcare workers that, that have been vaccinated that are now testing positive. Uh, Dr. Levine, is, is the state correlating data between vaccinated people, those that are testing positive, to try to track how many uh, people are, are testing positive that have already been vaccinated? And, and so what's that data showing? So right now the data is not very extensive because there's only a small number of people that we've documented uh, positive test in who have a history of being vaccinated and most of those it was between the first dose and the second dose so it was a time that they may not have yet may, um, uh, mustered the complete immune response that we're looking for from a vaccine so it's premature to really comment on any of those right now but rest assured if there is a person who becomes a case who has received vaccine we know about it because that's part of our uh, interview process uh, with, with uh, any positive case. So um, can't, I, I, I'm sure I'll be able to tell you much more at some later time in the pandemic when there's enough uh, cases that have evolved who have had vaccination, but right now it's very, very small. And I'm not aware of people after the second dose but I will ask the team about that uh, when I get back to see if that's uh, been found yet. Can you follow up with me uh, on first and second dose after you find that out today? Why don't we, we'll bring it up in the next press conference. Yeah, we find it. We'll, 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 we'll bring it up. Thank you. Okay, appreciate the follow up. Thank you. Hey, Greg, while we have you on, can you uh, remind at least me, uh, maybe somebody else knows this, uh, but I don't, I don't remember what the information that we promised you uh, to follow up on from last Friday. Um, yeah, I believe the health department uh, has followed up on it, but they, they haven't provided the list. I'm looking for a list of uh, outbreaks, much like what apparently has been given to other media sources. A, a list of other outbreaks from, from what sector? Uh, from the state of Vermont, I'm, I'm under the understanding, Governor, that you're provided a list, I believe, on a daily basis of, of outbreaks. And so I've asked for that list through a public records request. Uh, yeah. Yeah. The public records request takes a number of days. Okay. Uh, I think they're working on the public records request as we speak. It's not instantaneous as I uh, have seen. So um, I assume that they I, will I, be back with you. I understand that. I originally asked on Friday. That's why I'm saying, I, that's why I was just reminding you that I was looking for it. Oh. I appreciate your time, Governor. Thank okay, you. Okay, thanks.
Guy Page, Chronicle of the Vermont State House. Governor, yesterday seven Republican senators introduced a bill to expand funding for school resource officers. Comes a week after four Democratic and progressive senators introduced S-63 to ban school resource officers. Where do you stand on the state allowing or uh, perhaps funding uh, police assigned as school resource officers? Yeah, my, my opinion hasn't changed on this uh, guy. I think it's the same answer. Uh, that I uh, use when someone, maybe it was you, had asked me about the uh, initial ban on uh, resource officers in schools. I believe this is a local decision. I, I still believe it's a local decision. I don't think we should make it mandatory. Uh, I believe that uh, we do uh, provide uh, the, the funding for it through the Ed Fund. Uh, so it's, from my standpoint, it's, it's, a, it's a local decision and, and still should be. So you wouldn't support a statewide ban, but neither would you support a any sort of statewide rec, uh, requirement. That's it's correct. On the local level. Yes, that's correct. Okay. Yep. Thank you. Tom, the Vermont Standard. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my first question is for. Uh, Secretary French, um, Secretary French, the weekly and media outlets that are here typically come out on Wednesday or Thursday with uh, earlier in the week uh, deadlines. And so I'm wondering if you think it's possible that the new requirements for um, music programs in our schools uh, might be posted either over the weekend or as early as Monday so that we can get a local reaction from our uh, arts communities in the towns where there are weekly outlets? Yeah, thanks for the question. Um, I'm not sure yet that we are aiming for early next week. Uh, it definitely won't happen over the weekend. Um, but, uh, you know, we'll see how that goes. But we are trying to get it out as soon as possible and as soon as Monday, possibly. Thank you. I just and a follow-up, would that be posted on the uh, Department of Health website or on the Education Department website or both locations? Uh, it's on the Agency of Education website, and if uh, you want to reach out to us, we can email you a copy directly. Excellent. Thanks very much. I'll do that. Uh, second question, and this is presumably for uh, Commissioner Levine uh, or Secretary Smith. Um, I noticed uh, in uh, Dr. Levine's presentation this morning that um, on the active outbreaks in long-term care facilities, there seems to be a significant um, uh, uptick at the village of Cedar Hill in Windsor, and I'm wondering if uh, that's a sizable percentage of the total population of employees and uh, residents there. And I'm wondering if uh, you might be able to shed any more light on on that outbreak and uh, you know w w where it has occurred and uh, why it's so high. Yeah, Commissioner Levine will answer that. I just want to make sure we go back to the other um, a request for the information on Monday and just to remind everyone it is a federal holiday on, on Monday there'll be many uh, state employees who are not working many who are um, so I don't know if they'll be able to get all that information to you on Monday that may be a, a problematic Commissioner Lee. okay thanks for pointing that out though. yeah I really don't have any specifics to give you this moment about the outbreak you've referred to I know that our health care outbreak prevention and response team has provided guidance and has been on the scene so they understand what's going on there. Um, my main point in showing the slide was not to call attention to a facility like that but to call attention to the fact that we are seeing so much less of that at this point in time. Uh, I still want that mm -hmm. to be the take home message unfortunate as it is that this uh, facility has had an outbreak. All right, thank you very much, Dr. Levine. Lisa, the Waterbury Roundabout. Hi, good afternoon. I think this is a question for um, Dr. Levine. I was looking at the uh, updated community map for this week, and in Waterbury, we've seen the biggest uptick in this past seven day. Um, cycle from last Wednesday to this Wednesday that we've seen since November. Um, 
and so that just kind of jumped out at me. And I'm wondering, I know you have um, many uh, places on your list that you're keeping track of in terms of outbreaks and incidences that you're paying attention to, and I just wonder if there's anything on your radar there that um, kind of jumps out as far as um, what might be happening here in Waterbury, or if you just sort of attribute it to the community spread that you were talking about earlier. You're right. Uh, the number of outbreaks we're following is always around 80 or so. Um, but what we have found consistently throughout the state is less than 15% of all the cases that we document across the state have anything to do with a specific outbreak. So the outbreaks themselves are very modest in size and don't account for a high proportion of the cases, which again implies community transmission. I'll have to get uh, a deeper dive into the Waterbury data so that I can give you an appropriate response to your question. Um, but nothing has sort of uh, surfaced that um, has gone on the radar screen as a uh, area of intense scrutiny that needs to be followed up on. But we'll get back to you. Okay. Well, that, that's that's good to know just off the, the top of your head. That hasn't, it's not something that's super familiar, so that's, that's good to hear. Um, Thank you. Um, I have one other quick question for Secretary French. I think thinking, hearing the uh, discussion about music and sports last week now, um, it just occurred to me, I'm wondering if there's any discussion coming um, anytime soon regarding the guidance um, around physical education classes in schools, since that basically touches on all the kids that are in school. Um, if there's any look at um, loosening up some of the restrictions um, and the activities and, and requirements that they have right now. Yeah, thanks. Um, yeah, it's something we're going to take a look at. We met earlier this week, um, sort of as our regular planning cycle, looking at um, our larger school guidance document, which is about 40 pages. As I mentioned, our current music guidance is embedded in that larger document, and we'll be pulling that out essentially when we promulgate this new guidance. But we did make the decision to kind of, uh, we do this on a monthly basis, whether we've accumulated enough issues to reopen the 40-page document, and we're going to do that. Um, one of the issues uh, that we have is um, to sort of synchronize the, the PE classroom instruction uh, relative to our new guidance for winter sports. So we are going to take a look at that here in the coming days and weeks. Okay, great. That's, that's good to hear because um, it's, it's a similar, similar vein and uh, a lot of people are hoping that they might match up a little bit better. Thank you. Colin, seven days. Hi, thanks. Um, I had a question about what it sounds like is being called phase five, the um, chronic condition. Um, and I apologize if this has been asked in a previous press conference, I might have missed it, but I'm Curious as to whether people might, um, I guess, how people go about confirming that. Do they need approvals from their doctors, and will they automatically be contacted, or should they reach out to their doctors proactively? Could you just give us a little bit about the process there? Sure. Uh, Secretary Smith. Colin, there, there will be a verification process. What that will be, what that will look like, will roll out in the next uh, few weeks, but. Um, uh, all I can all I can say right now is there will be a, a multiple there will be an attestation. Uh, there may be some um, audit procedures in terms of making uh, how we look at this, and then secondly or thirdly, um, we will probably uh, utilize in some um, limited fashion the because we don't want to overwhelm them, the um, primary care physicians in this verification process, but there will be a verification process. And do you have any rough estimate of when uh, we might be moving into that phase five? I would, I would pencil in uh, somewhere mid to uh, uh, latter part of March. Got it. Thanks. The only other question I had is, do we have an, a figure for how many doses we're expecting to come next week? I'll get back to you. I think it's 10,375, but let me, let me verify that for you. Great. Thanks so much. Andrew, Caledonian Record. Yes, thank you. Good afternoon. Um, 
I have a question here from a fourth grader whose class has gone remote for the week uh, because of a positive case, but whose school is now gradually transitioning from 50% hybrid mode to a full in-person. Uh, student's question is, when we are all back in school together, will there be more COVID cases? Commissioner Levine, I, uh, I'll let you try that one first. And this question is a fourth grader. Um, have they been remote the entire time, or has it just occurred that they had to go remote? No, uh, they've been 50% uh, hybrid uh, okay. saved for a couple of times, including now when they've uh, had a case within their pod and have had to go uh, remote for a few days. Very good. We continue to have data that supports the fact that being in an elementary school class um, and having in-person learning is a very safe activity and one that rarely has to be interrupted by uh, going to uh, remote learning. So I guess my short answer would be that the, uh, this fourth grader should be very optimistic about the opportunity to go back be in person in class and not be in danger of getting COVID. Uh, I will also add that more recent uh, discussions on the part of the pediatric infectious disease community um, in a more national scene um, continues to uh, advocate that uh, further school reopening at the elementary school level uh, in and of itself doesn't require vaccination uh, and is inherently safe based on all of the data that's been accumulated nationally and internationally. We in Vermont are actually a little ahead of that curve already because we've had such a high proportion of our elementary school kids in class, and uh, the data here continues to support that that's been a very successful intervention. I do know that unfortunately across the country, a very high percentage of schools have been completely closed and been remote for a long time, especially in some of our larger urban areas. Uh, so all of the discussions you're hearing nationally from the new administration on down uh, are to really uh, focus on getting those elementary school kids back in an in-person learning situations. Okay, thank you for that. Um, uh, staying on topic with uh, Secretary French, uh, if I may, um, uh, school staffing challenges has been a pretty common topic this year. And I uh, recently read a superintendent's report to a local school board that highlighted some mid-year resignations as well as the anticipation that schools are likely to see a much higher than normal turnover rate going into next year because of the strain of this year. Um, do you see teacher retention and staffing as uh, statewide concerns um, uh, heading into next year? Uh, considering the difficulties of this one and other factors like uh, potential retirement plan cuts and things like that? Yeah, thanks. Uh, it could be. Uh, this is starting to be the time of year uh, when districts are finding out about um, staff uh, for next year. So they're, you know, they've completed their budget process and now um, they're working through uh, requirements of their master agreements and so forth that usually between now and April 1st, they'll have a sense of where the majority of their staff are in terms of retain, returning or not. Um, <clears throat> so it remains to be seen, but I would, would also observe that, um, you know, we still have the broader uh, demographic situations that were challenging in Vermont in terms of our aging population that existed prior to COVID. And um, those, those will manifest themselves in labor issues inside of education, just like they do in any other sector of our state. So we do, we do need to be attentive to uh, I'll call it pipeline issues and teacher development. Um, and that will, that will be a key consideration going forward for us as a state. Okay, thank you. Uh, not sure if there's time for me to ask one more. Okay, this one would be for Secretary Smith, uh, and um, it's uh, a reader uh, situation that caused a bit of concern um, with the online uh, vaccine registration process. Um, the reader is in the 70 to 74 bracket and helped a neighbor over 75 register. 
Um, that neighbor didn't have an email, so the reader used his own uh, based on the suggestion the other day to go in and set up an account to streamline the process for when it was uh, his turn. The reader discovered his email is now linked to the neighbor. Uh, are they going to have trouble registering come Tuesday uh, if their email's already been used uh, for the neighbor? Yeah, he's either he's either going to have to because that does the email links it uh, to that particular person. So what the what's going to have to happen is that person will have to either give the call center a call and they'll help them get registered or um, create another email address uh, through their for registration purposes and it's pretty easy to create another email address but yeah if he used the his email for that particular person we're he's either going to have to call the call center or create another email address Okay, thank you very much, everyone. Aaron, VT Digger. Hi, can you? Hi, um, I have a question about um, people in long-term care facilities who may have kind of changed their mind about getting the vaccine and actually, you know, initially refused, but they do want it now. Or maybe, I, I don't know the status of this, but new intakes or transfers to long-term care facilities. How are they going to be reached for the vaccine? Because my understanding is that pharmacists would kind of come in all points and vaccinate. Will there be another round? Um, will they be kind of contacted? Um, or is it kind of on an individual basis? Secretary Smith. Yeah, Aaron, with the pharmacy programs, there's three rounds uh, just to make sure that we can pick that up. But as you pointed out, there's going to be ongoing transfers uh, that will come in and come out of facilities. Hopefully during the age banding, we'll get most people in this state in terms of uh, vaccinated. But in those rare instances, um, they still qualify to be vaccinated. They're 1As. They're going to still qualify to be vaccinated. We'll probably use either our homebound sort of mechanism that we've developed or we'll use the hospital or our healthcare partners in order to do that. What we wanna do right now is just continue vaccinating those that are there, um, those that have, and we've done it with three, we've set up three rounds in order to make sure that people um, get vaccinated on this. But we will make sure that they have access to vaccination and can get vaccinated as we move forward. Yeah, because with the age banding, um, you know, if someone's not necessarily homebound, but facility bound, um, they might not be able to go through the typical process, right? So yeah. they would go through like the home health agency, would visit the long-term care facility? Yeah, we, I mean, that is their home. So we will, we will, um, bring uh, a vaccine to them if, uh, if there's no transportation. Not, not everybody in long-term care facilities are homebound, but that's their home. And if we have to, we'll bring the vaccine to them. Okay, thank you. That's it, record time. Um, want everybody to be safe over this uh, three-day weekend. Also, as a reminder, uh, the same holds true for the Daytona 500 as the Super Bowl. I know not as many people watch the Daytona 500 as the Super Bowl, but uh, no, no parties at home. Um, you know, watch it on TV. Uh, make sure you, you know, practice this uh, physical distancing. Just stay with your families uh, so that we can get some control on this and get through this uh, holiday weekend. So, again, thank you very much.